Welcome. This is where we simplify anatomy. And here we also learn anatomy with so much fun. Ride on with me as I unfold the anatomy of the esophagus. The esophagus is also referred to as the gullet or the food pipe, which literally means a pipe that carries food. It is a long tubular organ that is made up of fibrous tissue and muscular tissue. The muscular component of the esophagus can either be of skeletal muscle type or a smooth muscle type. And this is the esophagus highlighted in red. You see it running up from the pharynx down to the stomach. The sole function of the esophagus is to transport food particles from the pharynx up here down to the stomach down in the abdominal cavity. So this is the pharynx up here highlighted in blue and this is the stomach down in the abdominal cavity. The esophagus is about 25 cm in length and about 2 cm in width. You see the esophagus running or connecting specific region of the pharynx, which is the laryngopharynx, to the stomach down in the abdomen. We know that the pharynx is subdivided into three regions. If you've not checked up my lecture on the pharynx, please kindly go and do so to keep yourself updated. We know that the pharynx is subdivided into three regions. We have the nasopharynx. This is the nasopharynx up here, which is the most superior part of the pharynx. It is also referred to as the epipharynx. It is the nasopharynx because it is the region of the pharynx that is located behind the nasal cavity. And that is why it is termed nasopharynx. This is the nose race. And behind the nose race, we have the nasal cavity. Behind the nasal cavity, we then have the nasopharynx. Then inferior to the nasopharynx, we have the oropharynx. You can see how the name is being drafted, which is the region of the pharynx that is located behind the oral cavity. This is the oral cavity in the arterial part. And behind it is where we have the pharynx. But the specific region of the pharynx that is seen behind the oral cavity is the oropharynx. And inferior to the oropharynx, we have the laryngopharynx. This means that this region will be the subregion of the pharynx that will be located behind the larynx, and that is why it's called the laryngopharynx. This is the larynx in the anterior part, highlighted in black, and we know that the larynx is a collection of cartilages that are joined together by muscles and ligaments, and this is what we have in the anterior part, highlighted in black, and this region Posterior to heat, the specific region of the pharynx that we have is called the laryngopharynx. So you can see how the names of the subregions of the pharynx are being drafted. The different regions of the pharynx is named based on the structures that are located anterior to them. For the nasopharynx, we have the nasal cavity located anterior to it. For the oropharynx, we have the oral cavity anterior to it. And for the laryngopharynx, we have the larynx located anterior to it. So the names are being drafted based on the structures that are located anterior to them. That is about the pharynx. So if you want to establish the specific region of the pharynx that is connected to the stomach through the esophagus, we say that it is the laryngopharynx because this is the most inferior part of the pharynx. This is also referred to as the hypopharynx. So if you look at the part of the esophagus, you see that as it runs superiorly from the laryngopharynx down to the stomach, it's able to part or cross through three subregions, is able to cross through the cervical region, is able to cross through the thoracic region, and finally you see it crossing through the abdominal region. So as we go with this lecture, we'll be establishing the different subregions of the esophagus based on the path through which they run. So let's go through the location and the cause of the esophagus. We already established that the esophagus is seen to cross through the cervical region, the thoracic region, and also the abdominal region. Region. But let's see the specificity that is seen along this part. The esophagus begins at the lower border of the cricoid cartilage. And this is the region where that is marked, that is highlighted in white. The cricoid cartilage is a serine cartilage that is seen at the inferior border of the larynx. Remember in our previous slide, we already established that this is the larynx because posterior to this larynx is where we have the laryngopharynx, which is the region of the pharynx that is located behind the larynx. So there is a cartilage that is seen like a ring at the inferior border of the larynx, and this is called the cricoid cartilage. Inferior border of this cricoid cartilage is what marks 
marks the beginning or the origin of the esophagus. So at this region is where we have the beginning of the esophagus. And this tallies with the cyst cervical vertebra. So this is the cyst cervical vertebra level. So you see the esophagus beginning or originating from this region and it descends down through the cervical region, thoracic region, and abdominal region until when it gets to the 11th thoracic vertebra. And at this region is where it expands at the cardiac orifice, where it becomes the stomach. Going further in establishing the different subregions of the esophagus. So we have the cervical region. The cervical region of the esophagus will terminate at T1 thoracic vertebra. So from C6 to T1, this region is where we have the cervical region. And from T1 to T10 down here, which is the region that is bounded superiorly by broken yellow mark and also inferiorly by broken yellow mark. This region is where we have the thoracic region. And inferiorly, we have the region of the esophagus from T10 to T11. And this short region is where we have the abdominal region. Because if we try to establish how this region are also created, they are also named according to the space or the region where they run through. This is the cervical region because it's the region of the esophagus that runs through the cervical region. And this is the thoracic region because it's the region of the esophagus that runs through the thoracic region. And this is the abdominal region because it's the region of the esophagus that runs through the abdomen. You can see that this is very easy and understandable. So let's try and drive in further to see the parts that they run within these three subregions. And in doing this, we will be able to establish the different relations or structures that are related to them as they cross through these three subregions. For the cervical region, we already established that it runs from C6 to T1, and this is the region highlighted here. And this region, anteriorly, we have the trachea. So the esophagus in the cervical region is located posterior to the trachea. This is the trachea highlighted in green. And this can be established through surface marking. If you do the surface marking in the anterior midline region of the neck, you can feel the serine cartilages of the trachea. This is the trachea at the front. And behind it is where we now have the esophagus. So in the cervical region, the trachea is located anteriorly, while the esophagus is located posteriorly. So going further to the thoracic region, the thoracic region, we know that the central space in the thoracic region is further subdivided into two subregions. That is where we have the establishment of the mediastinum. If you've not also checked up my lecture on the mediastinum, please kindly go and do so to keep yourself updated. In that lecture, we establish how the mediastinum is subdivided into its different components. For the thoracic region, we know that in the central part, we have the mediastinum. Laterally, we have the lungs. So the central region is further subdivided into the superior mediastinum and the inferior mediastinum by the transverse thoracic plane. And this is the transverse thoracic plane. This transverse thoracic plane aligns with the T45 thoracic vertebra behind and also the manubrostana joint in the anterior part. So as this line is created, it tends to cross or cut the mediastinum into the superior component and an inferior component. Even though the two subregions, the superior and the inferior mediastinum are still part of the thoracic cavity. But just for us to establish the specificity that is seen or the cause the esophagus run within the thoracic cavity. So around the superior mediastinum, Anteriorly, we still have the trachea. This means that the esophagus is still located posterior to the trachea in the superior mediastinum. Another structure that is seen in the superior mediastinum, which is also part of the thoracic component of the esophagus, is the arc of aorta. So we have the arc of aorta, and this is the arc of aorta, still seen anterior to the esophagus in the superior mediastinum. The arc of aorta, we know that is a continuation of the ascending aorta, which of course emerges from the heart. And this arc, is also seen in the anterior part of the esophagus within the superior mediastinum. So let's go further to the inferior mediastinum. The inferior mediastinum, the specific region where we have the esophagus in the inferior mediastinum is the posterior mediastinum. We also know that the inferior mediastinum is further subdivided into the anterior, the middle, and the posterior mediastinum. The, this subdivision is established by the heart and also the pericardium. So the region of the inferior mediastinum that is located anterior to the heart and the pericardium is called the anterior mediastinum, while the region where we have the heart and the pericardium is called the middle mediastinum, while posteriorly we have another region of the inferior mediastinum that is located posterior to the heart and the pericardium, and this is called the posterior mediastinum. So the esophagus is seen to cross through the posterior mediastinum, 
which means that it will be seen behind the heart and also the pericardium. If we go back to the superior medial stenum, if you look at the part through which the esophagus run, you see that the esophagus run at the posterior region of the superior medial stenum. Even though the superior medial stenum does not have subdivision, but if we place it according to region, you see that the esophagus is located at the posterior region of the superior medial stenum. And that is how it packs downwards along that line. And that is why you can still see it within the posterior mediastinum, which is a subregion of the inferior mediastinum. And that is why we can say that the esophagus is seen specifically in the posterior mediastinum. So within the posterior mediastinum, structures that we see anterior to it include the heart. Remember that in the superior mediastinum, we have the arc of aorta. And we know that the arc of aorta is from the ascending aorta, which of course emerges from the heart. So we should expect that anteriorly in the posterior mediastinum, the structure that will be related to it will include the heart. So anteriorly, we have the heart. As this is established, the esophagus then descends down. Remember, we have the emergence of the descending aorta, the continuation of the hack. So we have the descending of the thoracic aorta highlighted here in red. And this region, this structure is seen to be located on the left side of the esophagus. So we have the esophagus located on the right part as it descends down within the posterior mediastinum. Then we have the thoracic aorta on the left side. So the esophagus is located on the right side of the thoracic aorta. But when it gets to the level of the T7 thoracic vertebra, there is going to be a deviation of the esophagus. So at this level, it will deviate and the deviation will go to the left. And the essence of this deviation is to be able to assess the esophagia hiatus. The esophagia hiatus is the O that is created on top of the diaphragm. We know that the diaphragm separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. This is the diaphragm highlighted in black, and it gives like a partitioning to separate the structures or organs that are located in the thorax from the abdomen. But some of these structures, of course, we need to pass through the diaphragm to be able to enter into the abdomen. And there is no other way that this can be done except if O's or hiatus are created on it. And that is why we have the creation of this O that is called the esophagia hiatus. And it is through this hiatus that is able to pass through the diaphragm to be able to enter into the abdomen. But this esophagia hiatus is created more on the left side of the diaphragm. And that is why this deviation or call to be able to assess the O so that they can pass through it and enter into the abdominal cavity. The deviation is about 2.5 centimeter from the median plane. So let's say this is the median plane. 2.5 cm from this region is where it deviates to the left to be able to assess the esophagia hiatus. So even though the esophagus and the thoracic aorta are seen within the posterior mediastinum, initially the thoracic aorta is seen on the left side while the esophagus is seen on the right side, even though it is still located posterior to it in a bit. But as it goes down to the level of the T7 thoracic vertebra, you see that the esophagus will cross to the left. And as it does this, it's going to be crossing the anterior surface of the thoracic aorta. So that is how the pattern is established but this deviation occurs at the level of the seventh thoracic vertebra so as it deviates it is now going to be crossing the thoracic or the descending aorta so as it crosses it you will see the esophagus crossing the anterior surface of the thoracic aorta because of this deviation so at the level of the t7 thoracic vertebra you see that the esophagus is not now seen on the right side of the descending aorta it is now seen to be crossing and being placed on the anterior surface of the thoracic aorta because of this crossing in the quest of being able to assess the esophagia aorta so that it can pass through it and enter into the abdomen so that is how that structural part occur the piercing occur at the T10 thoracic level. So it pierces it at this level and it enters into the abdominal space. And from T10, it pierces through the diaphragm. At T11, it's going to expand to become the stomach. You can see the established part of the esophagus from the cervical down to the thoracic region, then the abdominal region. So let's try and establish how food particles are controlled or directed into the esophagus. This is the entire configuration of the nasal cavity and the oral cavity. 
This is the nasal cavity above, and inferior to it, we have the oral cavity. There is also a demarcation or a partition in between these two cavities, and this is done by the palate. We have the hard palate at the front, and behind we have the soft palate. You know that these two cavities allow the passage of two different substances. This nasal cavity is established for the passage of air particles, and the oral cavity is established for the passage of food particles. So let's see how food is directed into the esophagus. The way food is ingested through the mouth, it goes through the oral cavity. In the oral cavity, the food is directed into the oropharynx. This is the oropharynx. This region down behind is the pharynx. But the pharynx, we already established in our previous slide that it is subdivided into three subregions, the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx. So food particles in the oral cavity will be directed through the oropharynx. This is the oropharynx behind the oral cavity. And from the oropharynx, it goes down into the laryngopharynx, which is the region of the pharynx that is located behind the larynx. This is the larynx up here. And inferior to the larynx, we have the trachea before it bifurcates into the two lungs. So this is the larynx. And posterior to it, we have the laryngopharynx. So food in the laryngopharynx here will then be directed into the esophagus. And the direction will only occur after we have the opening of the upper esophageal sphincter. The upper esophageal sphincter, which is a sphincter that controls the inflow of food into the esophagus, will open up so that food will be directed into the esophagus. From the esophagus, it then goes down into the stomach and go down the digestive tract. So that is how food is directed. But there is also a control channel that is created around the larynx. So let's see how this occurs. When food is ingested into the mouth, it goes to the oral cavity as we established. When it gets into the oropharynx, the next region that I should go to is the laryngopharynx. And there is a control channel here, which is the larynx. At the upper part of the larynx, we have the epiglottis. The epiglottis is like a flap that tends to open or closes, depending on the structures that is coming on its way. If it is food particles that we have from the oropharynx, the epiglottis, which is seen at the upper quarter of the larynx, it is going to flap down so that this flap will be dropped down. And as it drops down, it's going to close up the opening of the larynx at the upper part so that food particles will not be directed into the larynx because food particles are not needed in the larynx. If they enter into the larynx, they go down into the trachea to the lungs and that can lead to shocking. So it's going to close up so that food particles will be prevented from entering into the larynx and they will be redirected back into the laryngopharynx before the upper esophageal sphincter will open up, then food will go through into the esophagus then to the stomach. So this is the control mechanism that is established here. But if it is hair particles that goes in through the nose race, it goes to the nasal cavity. From the nasal cavity, it goes through to the nasopharynx. From the nasopharynx, it goes to the oropharynx. From the oropharynx, it's going to cross anteriorly to enter into the larynx. And this crossing will only occur if the epiglottis opens up. The epiglottis will definitely open up because it is hair particles, and that is what is needed within the larynx. So as it opens up, the hair will flow in through the larynx, go to the trachea, then to the lungs. Now with food in the esophagus coming through the laryngopharynx, the peristaltic action of the esophagus will enhance the movement of this food within the esophagus. Peristaltic movement are periodic contraction and relaxation. So as the wall of the esophagus contracts and relax, it will help to push down the food particles down into the stomach. And this is how this is established within this region. You can see that there is a lot of mechanism that is established around this region in helping to prevent shocking or preventing the movement of food into the airway because it is not needed there. It is needed in the GI tract. So let's look at the esophageal constriction. Within the wall of the esophagus, we have constrictions that are created. These constrictions are created the, to control the movement of food in and out and also within the esophagus. So we have four constriction points within the esophagus. So the first constriction is also referred to as the upper esophageal sphincter. This is the upper esophageal sphincter. And this sphincter is like the esophageal inlet. It helps to control the rate at which food particles are released into the esophagus. It is the narrowest constriction and it is created where the laryngopharynx connects with the esophagus. This is the laryngopharynx, which is the most inferior part of 
the pharynx. So it is at the junction of the laryngopharynx and the esophagus that we have the first constriction point, which is also referred to as the upper esophageal sphincter. This constriction is formed by the cricopharyngeal muscle. The muscle thickens around this area, and as it thickens, it helps to narrow the lumen, thereby controlling the rate at which food particles are being released into the esophagus. The distance between the upper esophageal sphincter or the first constriction point from the incisor teeth is about six inches. The second constriction point is formed at the level of the T45 thoracic vertebrae. This corresponds to the level of the hack of aorta, and this is the second constriction point. This constriction point from the incisor teeth is about nine inches. So it's nine inches from this region to the incisor teeth. Then the third constriction point is formed at the level of T5 this is thoracic vertebrae, and this corresponds to the level of the left principal bronchus. Remember, we already established that this is the trachea, and the trachea, of course, we finally bifurcate into the right principal bronchus and the left principal bronchus. It is at the level of the left principal bronchus that we have the third constriction point of the esophagus. And in measuring the distance of the third constriction point from the incisor teeth is about 11 inches. You can see that as we are going down, the distance between the constriction point and the incisor teeth tends to increase. And this is the third constriction point. Then the last constriction point is also referred to as the lower esophageal sphincter. This is the lower esophageal sphincter or the fourth constriction point. This point helps to control the rate at which food particles are released into the stomach. And of course, it is formed at the point where the esophagus expands to become the stomach. The distance between the fourth esophageal constriction point and the incisor teeth is about 16 inches. So we can see that as they go down, the distance between the constriction point and the incisor teeth tends to increase as we go downwards. So let's try and establish the different subregions of the esophagus. The esophagus, as it runs from the cervical region through the thoracic region and the abdominal region, it tends to present an anterior posterior flexure. And this flexure corresponds to the curvature of the, of the cervical and thoracic vertebrae. So it tends to align with the curvature of the spine. That is what is established here. So in trying to establish the three subregions of the esophagus, we should already have a clue of what is going to be established here. The first one is the cervical region of the esophagus. This is the cervical region of the esophagus. This is the region of the esophagus that is seen to run through the neck, you know, the cervical region. And the second region is the thoracic region. This is the longest region. The thoracic portion or region of the esophagus is about 20 cm in length and it is the region that is seen to run through the thoracic cavity and this is the thoracic region of the esophagus while the last region which is the shortest region it is seen to run through the abdomen and this is the abdominal region of the esophagus this is about 1.5 cm in length so you can see the different established region of the esophagus so let's try and drive in into each of these subregions and see what they present. For the cervical region of the esophagus, we already said that it's from C6 to T1 thoracic vertebra, and it's about 3.5 centimeter in length. This is the second longest region of the esophagus. The upper one third of this region is made up of skeletal muscle, while the lower two third is made up of smooth muscle. So let's try and see the structures that are also related with the esophagus within the cervical region. So the relations anteriorly, we already established that we have the trachea in the anterior part in our previous slide. And this is the trachea highlighted in green. Posteriorly, we have the cervical vertebrae at the back, and this is the cervical vertebrae at the back. We also have the longus coli muscle. The longus coli muscle are muscles that are associated with the cervical vertebrae. And we have fibers of this muscle also in the posterior relation of the esophagus within the cervical region. Then we have the prevertebral fascia. The prevertebral fascia is seen to surround the vertebrae and also the associated muscle. So you see a fascia that is helping to hold the associated muscle and the vertebrae together. So we also have this fascia as a posterior relation of the cervical region of the esophagus. So laterally, what is seen is the posterior region of the thyroid gland. We know that the thyroid gland is located in the anterior part. This, of course, will run 
to the posterior part. So the posterior region of the thyroid gland is what is seen to be related laterally to the esophagus behind. So that is logical. We also have the common carotid artery also related to it in the lateral part. So the blood supply of the cervical region of the esophagus is by the inferior thyroid artery. The inferior thyroid artery emerges from the thyrocervical trunk, which of course is a branch of the subclavian artery. As we go down with other region, we see that the blood supply of the different regions of the esophagus are different. Let's go further to the thoracic part of the esophagus. The thoracic part of the esophagus extends from the T1 to T10 thoracic vertebrae. It measures about 20 cm in length as established. This is the longest region of the esophagus. So let's also try and look at the relations of the thoracic part of the esophagus. Remember, the central part of the thoracic cavity is divided into the superior and the inferior mediastinum by the transverse thoracic plane. And now we have the transverse thoracic plane along the T45 thoracic vertebrae that helps to divide the central compartment of the thorax into the superior and the inferior mediastinum. We are going to be separating relations within the superior mediastinum and also the posterior mediastinum, which is a subdivision of the inferior mediastinum. For the superior mediastinum, the trachea is still seen to be located anterior to the esophagus. So we have the trachea. We also have the arc of aorta also seen to be related anterior to the esophagus. We know that the arc is a continuation of the ascending aorta, which of course emerges from the heart. Then we have the right pulmonary artery. Then if you go more inferiorly, remember that at the T45 thoracic vertebra, we have the bifurcation of the trachea into the right primary bronchus and the left primary bronchus. The structures that are located or related anterior to the esophagus in the posterior mediastinum, which of course is a subdivision of the inferior mediastinum is the left principal bronchus. So we see the left principal bronchus as an anterior relation within the posterior mediastinum. Then another structure that is seen is the art because we already have the arc of aorta above. So we know that the arc of aorta is a continuation of the ascending aorta which of course is from the heart. So we should expect that the heart will also be seen as the anterior relation although at the inferior part and that is what is established here. So we have the heart in the anterior relation. And the specific region of the heart that we have that is related anterior to the esophagus within the posterior mediastinum is the left atrium. Before it gets to T7 thoracic vertebral level and it deviates, we already said that this deviation is to assess the esophageal hiatus. So this is what is related to it anteriorly within the superior mediastinum and inferior mediastinum. And posteriorly, the relations of the thoracic part of the esophagus are to the thoracic vertebrae. This is the thoracic vertebrae highlighted in black, seen at the posterior part of the esophagus. We also have the descending aorta, which is also referred to as the thoracic aorta. The thoracic aorta is a continuation of the hack of aorta. So we should expect that it will be seen at the posterior part of the esophagus because we have the hack in the anterior part and the heart also in the anterior part. So we have the thoracic aorta. We have the posterior intercostal arteries. We have the azygous vein. We have the hemiazygous vein and also the accessory hemiazygous vein. Then we have the thoracic duct. So those are the structures that are located posterior to the esophagus within the thorax. Also talking about the blood supply, remember that we said that in the cervical region, the esophagus is supplied by the inferior thyroid artery. In the thoracic region, it is supplied by branches from the thoracic aorta. This is the thoracic aorta, which continues from the arc of aorta. So this descending aorta or the thoracic aorta, it gives off esophageal branches to supply the thoracic part of the esophagus. Let's look at the abdominal part of the esophagus. The abdominal part of the esophagus is the shortest region, and it is seen between the 10th and the 11th thoracic vertebrae. You can imagine how short this region is. It's about 1.5 cm in length. This is where we have the abdominal region of the esophagus. And relations, anteriorly, is related to the left lobe. So why the left lobe of the liver? This is the liver highlighted in green. I will know that the liver is located anterior to the stomach. And if it is located anterior to the stomach, and we already said that the esophagus becomes expanded 
to become the stomach, it means that the esophagus will be seen to be located posterior to the liver. But what specific region of the liver we want to establish? This is the right lobe of the liver and this is the left lobe of the liver. And also remember we, we said that the esophagus at the level of the T7 thoracic vertebra deviates to the left. So as to be able to assess the esophageal hiatus. So at this level, there is already a presentation of the esophagus towards the left region. And that is why in the anterior part, it, it will only be related to the left lobe of the liver. And that is why we have the left lobe specifically as the anterior relation of the abdominal part of the esophagus. Then we have the anterior vagal trunk. This is the liver, the right lobe. And of course, we have the left lobe on this other side that forms the anterior relation of the abdominal part of the esophagus. And posteriorly, we have the posterior vagal trunk. We have the left cross of the diaphragm and also the left inferior phrenic artery, which is a branch of the abdominal hiatus. So those are the structures that are located posterior to the abdominal part of the esophagus. Then the blood supply of the abdominal region of the esophagus is from the left gastric artery. The left gastric artery is a branch of the celiac trunk. It can also receive supply from the left inferior phrenic artery, which is a branch of the abdominal aorta. So you can see that the blood supply of the different regions of the esophagus are different. Let's talk about the innervation. For sympathetic innervation, sympathetic innervation of the esophagus is supplied by the sympathetic trunk. For the parasympathetic innervation, we have the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which supplies the upper region of the esophagus. And we have the vagus nerve, which supplies the lower region of the esophagus. Let's look at clinical anatomy. Let's look at esophageal varices. This is an abnormal dilation of the submucosal vein in the esophagus. And this occurs as a result of increased pressure in the portal drainage of the liver. If there is an increased pressure in the drainage of the liver, it's going to cause the expansion of the mucosal veins in the esophagus. And this is associated with advanced liver disease. And this is seen to be predisposed to bleeding and may come with vomiting of blood. The second clinical anatomy is esophageal cancer, and this is when cancerous cell is seen to develop within the esophagus. These are malignant because they have the capacity to spread to the surrounding tissue. The symptoms include dysphagia. Dysphagia is difficulty in swallowing. There's going to be a restricted food passage because of the tumor growth. Also, weight loss, heartburn, and coughing are also symptoms of osphagia cancer. And treatment includes surgery, chemotherapy, or radiation treatment option. So thanks for watching this video. Let's meet again.